I don't know where to start tonight. I'm so touched by your kindness and your prayers, most of all. Dr. Griffiths leaned over to me a moment ago and said he'd come to hear his favorite preacher tonight. I said, well, I'm sorry that Brother Toby Morgan couldn't be here, but he'll settle for what he gets tonight. I don't have to ask what I already know the answer to, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to chime in. You have to know that you have one of the most creative, energetic, passionate men and his wife leading this state. You know that, don't you? I'm talking about Bishop Wayne Doherty and Shelley. And all the state team, the Hagers, the Buleys, the Chapmans, all of you, thank you so much for hosting me tonight. Bishop Doherty was kind enough to mention my book, Furnace Grace, The Power to Stand When the Heat is On. I preached this last year when I was here and left this camp meeting, and uh, it became the book. And someone was so generous to provide that it be sent to every Church of God pastor in uh, North America. It's now been translated in Spanish, so it's just now going out to our Hispanic pastors as well. So if you did not get one, Pastor, make sure that you contact uh, our office. We want to make sure that you have it absolutely free. Now, you may be sitting there saying, I'm not a pastor. How do I get mine free? Well, it's simple. Start a church. It's free for pastors. Everybody else has to pay, but uh, I hope you'll get that. And, you know, those old songs like we're singing, I was raised on those songs. And I've always wanted to record an album with just the Redback Hymnal songs. And out of all my years of recording and singing, I had never done that until most recently. And uh, we put together a CD called Sunday Singing. And it's got about 17 of those old songs in one configuration or another. Some of them are medleys. Some of them are single songs. But they've got them back there at our table tonight. That book and several others are back there. But I especially want you to get that CD, Sunday Singing. I hope it will be a blessing to you. When Brother Doherty called me the day before yesterday. I had just touched down in Minot, North Dakota. And... I was on another call when he called, and I quickly went to his call because when your state overseer calls, you want to answer that call. And he is my state overseer. And he invited me to do this tonight and be with you, and uh, I was honored at the invitation. And when I concluded the call with Bishop Doherty, my mind immediately went to what the Lord possibly would have me speak on tonight. And I can only ask you to believe me when I tell you that the, that the Spirit of the Lord spoke to my heart and said to me, go back and uncover an old well and let me use it to refresh my people tonight. In all of the camp meetings that I have been in, I've been speaking on a lot of different issues, a lot of different things confronting the church, and I've done that here before and will do it again at the General Assembly. But I really heard the Lord say, just go uncover an old well and use it to let me refresh my people. So with that in mind, I'm going to look in the book of Ruth, chapter 2. If you've heard me preach much, you've heard me preach through the years from the book of Ruth. When I pastored years ago in Virginia, I spent about four months on these four little chapters talking about the reflections of redemption that are seen in this book. For it not to be included in the New Testament, it is a book that is so full of gospel having to do with redemption, that it astounds me. 
But for tonight, I'm particularly fond of two verses that I want to lift for you before I begin to expound upon them in verse 15 and 16. Talking about Ruth, it says this. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them, that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley, 77 pounds of barley. Father, I pray tonight for people that I love. I pray tonight for people that I've come to admire. I work with a lot of these folks. And Lord, I have not found greater faithfulness anywhere than what I have found here in Tennessee and among those that labor in your vineyard here in Cleveland and elsewhere. And Lord, I really believe I heard you speak to me and you said, uncover an old well and let the water of it refresh these wonderful, hardworking people tonight. And I pray, Lord, that every pastor, every pastor's companion, the laity and all will be strengthened by the Word of God in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. 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 I really do love this little book. I love it for a lot of reasons, but primarily I love it because it is a love story. It's the story of boy meets girl. They fall in love and they live happily ever after. And I really like stories that end that way. But for as beautifully as this story ends, this story has a very tragic opening, a very tragic beginning. The opening few verses of Ruth chapter 1, we are introduced to a family doing their best to cope with the devastating effects of a famine. Now for me to just pitch the word famine out there to you, I don't think it will conjure up in your mind what really is taking place here. Because it is the most severe of times when men and women are famished, they're hungry, and their children are dying. And this family that takes a prominent place in this story is headed up by a man by the name of Elimelech. Elimelech. He had a wife by the name of Naomi. They had two sons, Malon and Kilion. Elimelech, his name meant God is king. Specifically, it meant God is my king. But you would have never known that by his life, and you certainly would have not known it by his decisions. Because during this time of famine, Elimelech makes some decisions that bring complete devastation to himself and to his family. He basically announces to his wife Naomi one day in the midst of this famine, Honey, I've decided what we're going to do. We're going to pack up and pick up and peel out. And they decided to leave Bethlehem, Judah. Now, the names Bethlehem, Judah mean the house of bread and praise. And what's interesting is that a place known for bread has none. A place known for praise has no praise. And so he says, we're leaving the house of bread and we're going into Moab. Now the name Moab, much like Egypt, typifies worldliness, sin. And where Bethlehem may typify the church, Moab typifies the world. And so basically, Elimelech was announcing to his family, we're leaving the church and we're just going to roam in the world. His decision shows us several flaws in his character. 
First of all, he was a man that had no faith. He based his decision to leave Bethlehem entirely on how he was feeling, not how he was faithing. He was a sensual man. He lived by the dictates of his five senses, what his eyes saw, what his ears heard, what his nose could smell, what his hands could feel. His senses encroached upon him. And based upon what he was sensing and what he was feeling, he made his decision, we are going to leave the will of God, even though we're going through a famine, even though times are tough, we are going to leave the blessed place and we're going to roam in the world, Moab. You know the story of Moab. Moab came from that horrible relationship that Lot had with one of his daughters when they came out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and God cursed it from that day forward. But that's where Elimelech took his family from the house of bread to the place of worldliness. Based on how he was feeling. He could smell the stench of death everywhere. His eyes beheld the dying in the streets. His hearing brought to him the midnight moans of the hungry and dying children. And based on how he was feeling, he said, we're leaving while we still can. Whatever the results are later, we'll just have to deal with that later. But right now, based on how I feel, we've got to get out of here. And yet we know here tonight, the Bible tells us that the just shall live by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We live by faith faith, but how many of us have been caught in the trap of living by the dictates of how we feel? I'll never forget one Monday morning, a man called me when I was pastoring in Danville, Virginia. The night before, Sunday night, we'd had one of those heaven on earth kind of church services. I mean, we did everything you can do in a Pentecostal service. We ran, we jumped, we fell out, got up, and fell out a second time. We did everything you can do in a good old Church of God Pentecostal service, and he was in the middle of all of it. He ran around the building several times. He jumped up and down several times. He fell out several times, and he walked past me when it was all over, hooping and hollering. He said, bless God, Pastor, I'm full now. Bring on the devil. I'm ready for him. I could run through a troop and leap over the wall now, and I thought, I wish you hadn't said that. Because Monday morning, he calls me bright and early. And he says, Pastor, you got to pray for me. I don't even feel saved today. I said back to him, well, I'll pray for you, but you got to pray for me first because I don't feel saved either, and I preached last night. But here's the deal, folks. We're not saved by how we feel. Although I'm not feeling too bad right now. No, I don't always feel like preaching. I don't always feel like singing. I don't always feel like climbing on a plane and go to the next place. I don't always feel this. Here's one that will make you want to listen to the rest of this sermon. I don't always feel saved real good. But I'm not saved by how I feel. I'm saved by what I know. And what I know is that old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. What I know is I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. What I know is I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm not here tonight based on how I feel. I'm here based on what I know. He had no faith. These last two years, we've based too many things on how we feel. So don't even make me go down that trail. Second flaw in his character was he had no hope. He came in one day and announced to Naomi, it's hopeless. It was bad yesterday. It's been bad for a long time. It's bad now. 
It's always going to be bad. No, not always. As long as there's a God in heaven, the future is bright as the noonday sun. He said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, thoughts to do you good and not evil. I have a hope and a future for you. But Elimelech had no hope. He had no faith. He had no patience. He said, we're leaving now. We're not going to wait and see if it gets better. We're leaving now. And so he packs up his family, and he and Naomi walk down the roads, leaving Bethlehem, dragging behind them two young people that didn't have a choice in the matter. Can I preach right there just a minute? Now, you can get mad at the church. You can get mad at your pastor. And you can throw a fit and pout and walk out the door in a human rage, but just remember who's following you when you walk out. Five or ten years down the road, when you come to your senses and want to behave right again and come back to the church, just remember that you dragged behind you Malon and Kilion when they didn't have a choice. Now they've grown up and they're making decisions of their own. He had no patience. And if you'll read God's Word in the Old Testament, you will record 13 different famines that are written about. Some of them lasted longer than others. Some of them were quite more severe than others. But there's one thing all 13 had in common. Get ready. This is profound. Not one of them lasted forever. I've got an announcement to you tonight. Pandemic doesn't last forever. Sickness doesn't last forever. Sorrow doesn't last forever. My God, don't lose your faith. Don't lose your hope. Don't lose your patience. I'm telling you there's a God in heaven who stands by his word. So they leave Bethlehem, and they go to Moab. And there are three key words and phrases that describe this plight. The Bible said they sojourned in the land of Moab. Dr. Griffiths, you know the word sojourn means a temporary trip. It means we're leaving, but we plan to come back someday. We've heard about a better show across town we're going to go see that show and that church, but we'll, we'll be back someday. Oh, I don't know if I'm mad or anointed right now. We're going to sojourn. It's just temporary. We'll get past this. We'll get over it. But the Bible said where Elimelech was concerned, he sojourned, but he continued there. He continued in his sin. He continued in his rebellion. And then the Bible said he died there. The epitaph of a backslider. He sojourned, he continued, and then he died there. And the first six verses of Ruth chapter 1 take in a decade. They take in 10 years. Can I tell you that 10 years is a long time to be out of God's will? And in 10 years, Elimelech has died. Malon has died. Kilion has died. And in the process of those 10 years coming and going, they have married two Moabite women, which was a violation of God's word. God had said in his word, going all the way back to the days of Moses and Levitical law, don't mix and mingle with that crowd. Don't marry into the Moabite people to the 10th generation and forever. But who do they marry? Because mom and dad, in a time of despair, lost their faith, their hope, and their patience, and they dragged their family to Moab, and these boys marry Moabite girls. Ten years come and go, and the three men are now dead. And we get to the heart of Ruth chapter 1, and we are now at a funeral. We're now at the graveside service of the last son. They're weeping. 
They're agonizing. They're crying. They're distraught because the father Elimelech has died. Malon has died. Kilion has died. They don't know what to do. They don't know where to turn. By this time, Naomi is a bent, broken widow and a childless widow with that. There are no bank accounts. There are no sons that she can fall back on and get some help from. She is totally by herself in this situation when suddenly she hears some news. Bouncing off every canyon wall, echoing through every valley. Naomi, you've been gone for 10 years, but we've got some good news for you. There's bread back at Bethlehem. The famine is over. The rains have fallen, and the harvest has come back in. The harvest that evaded us for so long, the stalks that have been broken and dried up for so long, I've got good news for you, Naomi. There's bread back on the table. The harvest has come back to Bethlehem. Oh, that God would help us leave this camp meeting service tonight and tell all of Cleveland, C and Tennessee, and all of this state, the bread is back at Bethlehem. Revival has come back to the church of God. The Holy Ghost is moving again. I'm so sick of bad news. I don't know what to do. I don't need to hear another thing out of Washington, D.C. I don't need to hear another thing out of the state capitol. I need somebody to stand up and shout, there's bread back at Bethlehem. Tell the lost there's bread back at Bethlehem. Tell the drug addict there's bread back at Bethlehem. Tell the alcoholic there's bread back at Bethlehem. Tell the prostitute there's bread back at Bethlehem. My God, I'm not giving up on this church. I'm not giving up on revival. God is blessing his people again in giving them bread. I feel the Holy Ghost here. When so much is at stake, there's bread back at Bethlehem. When we live in a time when the survival of society is at stake, there's bread back at Bethlehem. When we live in a time when the sanctity of life is at stake, there's bread back at Bethlehem. When we live in a time when the souls of men are at stake, there's bread back at Bethlehem. When we live in a time when culture needs to be confronted, there's bread back at Bethlehem. When we live in a time when doctrinal recklessness needs to be condemned, there's bread back at Bethlehem. I'm going to say it again. I'm not giving up on the church of God. There's, there's bread. Back at Bethlehem. My God, somebody raise your hands and praise him. Y'all don't want me to preach. You're all waiting on Jason Crabb to get here tomorrow night. My God, it's time for us to straighten up. There's bread back at Bethlehem. It's time for us to quit listening to the mess that's going on around us. There's bread back at Bethlehem. Oh, yeah. There's people thinking we're going to split wide open in San Antonio. No, there's bread back at Bethlehem. There's people that think we don't know what to do about the situations we find ourselves in in this nation. No, there's bread back at Bethlehem. Naomi, you've been out of God's will for 10 years. It's time for you to straighten up and get back here. She points her face in the direction of Bethlehem, standing right there on the spot in that funeral. She says, I've made a conscientious decision. I'm going home. Good decision, but not easily accomplished because she's got some baggage on her hands that she didn't have 10 years earlier. She's got two daughters-in-law she don't know what in the world to do with. Folks, this really happened. When I was preaching this in my church, I made that statement. I said, she's got two daughters-in-law she don't know what to do with. A man in the back of the building stood up and screamed, I got that same trouble! I just called for prayer, and we went to the house. I promise you, he did. 
<laughs> it wasn't too awesome that night. <laughs> Two daughters in law. One by the name of Orpah. You know, names in this story are very interesting. Malon and Kilion, their names meant sick and pining. Naomi's name meant sweet, pleasant woman. Try this one. Orpah meant stiff neck. Isn't that special? <laughs> Invite her over for Christmas next year. <laughs> and then she's got Ruth. Now, one of the renderings of Ruth's name is beauty, and I just think it's so wonderful how God knows how to drop a little beauty in every circumstance. So she's got stiff neck and beauty here. And she looks at them and gives them both a quick lesson in Hebrew history and culture. She said, now girls, think about this. The law provides that when a man dies, his brother can marry the widow. And they can raise up children to his name and keep the family lineage going. But in this case, there is no brother. They're both dead. And newsflash, there's not going to be a brother. Because if I were to marry tonight, even if I were young enough to do that, if I were to marry tonight, nobody expects you to wait on that process. So here's the thing. I release you. Go back to your people. Go back to your gods. Go back to Moab. And the Bible gives this tender description of how they wept and they held on to one another and they cried and they wailed. And the Bible says that Orpah kissed Naomi and said, I hate to admit it, but it makes the best sense. And she said goodbye to Naomi. But Ruth clinged to her. And some of the most beautiful poetry in the whole Bible is right here when she said, Entreat me not to leave thee. Whether thou goest, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. One kissed and left, and one clinged and stayed. That shows me two kinds of people we've got in this world. Two kinds of people we got in this church. You got kissers, and you got clingers. You got that crowd that'll kiss you goodbye when the sun gets hot. You got that crowd that when times get tough, they'll kiss you goodbye and go to the next thing. But on the other hand, God's raising up a Ruth spirit. God's raising up a Ruth generation that are wrap its arms around vision and wrap its arms around mission. And Ruth will say, you're not pushing me out of your church. You're not pushing me out of your life. You're not getting rid of me that easy because I believe in the word of God. I believe in the mission of the church. I believe in the vision of the pastor. And Ruth says, whether thou goest, I will go. So one kisses and leaves. One clings and says, I'm going where you're going. So they point their face in the direction of Bethlehem. And here they go. Don't forget, it's been 10 years since they've seen Naomi. And as they're walking back into Bethlehem, the townspeople recognize Naomi. And they begin to speak among themselves. And they say, look, there's Naomi. It's been 10 years. Time has taken its toll. The gray in her hair, the stoop in her shoulder, the slow in her steps. Oh, but it's still Naomi. I'd recognize her anywhere. She stopped them. She said, don't call me that anymore. Call me Mara because I'm very bitter. I left here full, but I've come back empty. God has dealt with me bitterly. So from now on, call me Miss Mara. Another time, another place, I'll preach on this subject. They never called her Mara. Read it for yourself. They never did call her Mara because they saw the potential in her life regardless of her circumstances. They make their way into Bethlehem and set up housekeeping. And Ruth looked at Naomi one day and says, somebody's got to get a job. And the Bible said that Ruth would treat her mother-in-law better than seven sons would have treated her. She says, Mama, somebody's got to get a job. You stay here and take care of household things. I'm going to go find work. And the Bible says that she went out 
And it was her hap, H-A-P, happenstance, happening. It was her hap. It almost sounds accidental. It was her hap to come to part of the field that belonged to Boaz. She don't know who Boaz is, but he's going to act as the kinsman redeemer in this story before it's over. All she knows is that he's a man that owns this field, and she's going to get a job and work in his field. So every day, she just works in his field, picking up barley, faithful from daylight to dark. From morning to night, she joins the welfare program of that day and time with the other poor people of that city, and they would go through the fields picking up barley. Faithful to Boaz's field. Faithful to the field of Boaz. Because she knew Boaz didn't pay long distance. She couldn't work in somebody else's field and expect Boaz to pay her. Oh, you don't want me to even go down that trail. She comes home one day after working in Boaz's field and just dumps it all out. And Naomi says, my Lord, girl, where have you been to get all that? And Ruth says, hey, I don't know. There's a field right out here. It belongs to a man named Boaz. And when Naomi heard the name Boaz, she said, whoa, he's kinfolks. We need him. Because when we left here 10 years ago, Elimelech and I walked out on all of our debts. We walked out on all of our bills, and I've been owing them ever since with interest. And I've walked back in, and I have no way of paying those bills. But this man, Boaz, he can act as a kinsman redeemer. In the Hebrew, that's goel, G-O-E-L. And if you were going to be a kinsman redeemer, here's the deal. You had to be a relative of the person you were going to help. A good friend couldn't do it for you. Secondly, you had to have the right price. You had to be able to reach into your pocket and pull out of your pocket exactly what it took to pay them out of debt. Thirdly, you could not be contaminated with what you were trying to help somebody get out of. If you'll pay attention, you won't have to work so hard this Saturday getting a sermon for Sunday. Fourthly, you had to be able to do it all but fifthly, you had to be willing to do it all because it's one thing to be able, but it's another thing to be willing. Oh, don't let me take time to preach right there. Can I tell you about our heavenly kinsman redeemer, our Lord Jesus Christ? Praise God. He had the right price. He was free from what he came to set us free from until he became sin. He that knew no sin became sin so that we might be redeemed. But the best news is he was able and he was willing. Naomi looks at Ruth. She says, my Lord, girl, whatever you do, stay in his field. Don't let anybody look up and see you in another man's field. You stay faithful to his field. So every day, she just put that bag on her shoulders and go to that field. Faithful, consistent, true. And Boaz showed up one day. He went to sit with his hired hands for lunch. And the Bible tells us they were sitting there eating parched corn, butter dripping off both ends. Roasted, parched corn. Surely there were biscuits and gravy nearby somewhere. <laughs> An ancient Mideastern cracker barrel. Mm, mm. I bear witness with that. 
And Boaz comes along, and he's sitting there looking at all of his hired hands eating this parched corn and having this good time. And his eyes fall on Ruth. And he asks this question. Whose damsel is she? In the words, tell me more about her. I like her looks. And they said, that is Ruth the Moabitess. She is the daughter-in-law of Naomi who was the wife of Elimelech. And when he heard all those dots connect, he said, wait a minute. She's kin to me. We're going to take special good care of her. He said, here's what I need you to do, boys. And he looked at his hired hands. And he said, before that lady gets up from this table and adjusts her bonnet and puts that bag back around her shoulders, you get up from this table. And everywhere you think she might walk, drop handfuls on purpose. On purpose. Intentional. Can I tell you God's not an accidental God? He's not a haphazard God. He's not like that God I heard about one night. I was in a service one night and somebody jumped up and gave out this loud message in tongues that you can hear from the back of the tabernacle. Yay! And then no one quickly interpreted. So they thought they had to interpret themselves. You know, we can't stand silence. And the interpretation went like this. Thus saith the Lord, as I was with Moses in the lion's den, so shall I be with thee. In a few seconds, they jump back up and say, yay, yay, yay. Thus saith the Lord, I thy God have made a mistake. That wasn't Moses, that was Daniel, and they sit down again. I got news for that, brother. The Lord doesn't make mistakes. He knows when to show up, and he knows what to show up with. I came by to tell you, he knows your address. He knows your location. He knows where you are. Oh, let me preach right there. The Bible said it was her hap. No, it's not an accident with God. It was her happenstance, it says, that she came to that field. No, let me, let me tell you how she got in that field. She started that trip to Boaz Field way back in Moab. When she said, your God shall be my God, God leaned over the heaven's balconies and said, I heard that. I heard that, Ruth. And from that day forward, God put his hand on her shoulder. He pushed her ahead, and he backed her up. He turned her left, and he turned her right. He made her go around that corner and get around that rock until one day he landed her slap dab right in Boaz Field. Somebody asked me when I came in tonight, how far away do you live from here? How long did it take you to get to church? You know what my answer is? 45 years. That's how long it took me to get here tonight. 45 years. Because 45 years ago, I knelt at an altar in a little place called Graham, Texas. And I made my vow and my commitment to God. I said, God, if you'll open the door, if you'll fill me with the Holy Ghost and set me on the right path, I'll preach for you. I'll work for you for the rest of my life. You shall be my God, my Jehovah God. And God put his hand on my shoulder. He pushed me forward. He backed me up. He turned me left. He turned me right. And here I am on a Thursday night preaching to you. I don't know who has to clean this up, but God bless you. Boaz sends his young men out there. He says, wherever you think she might walk, wherever you think she might travel down, you make sure there's handfuls on purpose. She adjusted her bonnet, put that sack on her shoulder, and she started walking. Her tummy is full of parched corn. And she's dabbed her mouth. She straightened herself up and she's ready for an afternoon. Things look sparse for a while. And the sun's beating down hot. 
and sweat stripping off the tip of her nose. Somebody says, is that in the Bible? No, but it don't have to be. Because I've been out in the field. I know how it goes out there. It gets hot, and your back gets sore, and your hands get calloused, and your spirit gets weak, and you get discouraged, and then the devil will start talking to you. Now, that's in the Bible. I mean, he talked to Jesus. He'll talk to you. The servant is no better than his master. He'll talk to you. And I can tell you what he'll say. He'll say to you what he said to Ruth. Who even knows you're here? Where do you think Orpah is now? Why, Miss Stiffneck went back to Moab. I guarantee you she's married a prince and she's got a house full of servants probably a house full of kids, wherever she's at, whatever she's doing, I can promise you she's not out in the fields of Bethlehem picking up barley for a man she doesn't even know. That's what he'll say. You've heard him. Who even knows you pastor this church? When's the last phone call you got from a neighboring pastor? Who even cares? Who gives half a hallelujah? Hallelujah that you're out here. And her back is sore and she's been over. And she's thinking about family back home and she's thinking about Moab. She's thinking about the price she paid to sell out to a woman that only God knows what's going to happen to her when all of a sudden her eyes fall on the first handful on purpose. And she says, my, my, business is picking up now. And she walks on a little further. And about the time the devil would try to lie and whisper again, her eyes fell on the next handful of purpose. And she says, you know what? I think I can do this a while longer. And she walked on a little further. And every time her back got sore, and with every drop of sweat that came off the tip of her nose, she saw another handful of joy and a handful of hope and a handful of love and a handful of provision and a handful of compassion. All day long, she worked that field picking up one handful after the next. Somebody said, preacher, how do you make it? Oh, I guess it's one camp meeting after the next. No, not at all. Oh, I guess it's one big convention after, no, not at all. How do you make it, preacher, in a pandemic? How'd you make it when you had to make that call about postponing assembly? And everybody thought you was the Antichrist for about three months. How do you make it when all hell's breaking loose everywhere? Am I preaching all right tonight? I know John Childers slobber knocked everybody last night, but I'm just up here doing my best. How do you make it, preacher, when nobody understands your motives and somebody wants to question your integrity? Oh, I get it. It's one convention. It's one big service. No, 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 no. I'll tell you how. It's one handful at a time, and sometimes it's two or three or 10 or 12 or 50 in a day, but God has never failed to give me the supply. I feel the Holy Ghost in this house. God has never failed to give me the supply of what I had to have. Somebody praise him in this house. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Somebody raise your hands and praise him. Hey. Reach over and slap somebody on the shoulder and say he's preaching all over you right now. Oh, you don't have time. And all day long she picked them up. And all my life long, I picked them up. 
Is that Keith Mumford I see back there in that balcony? Wave at me, Keith. That man's mother-in-law. Precious saint going to heaven. Was one of my handfuls on purpose one day. I'd gone to a church that three months before I got there was running 600. The month I got there, they ran less than 300. Nobody told me they had a split. It really wasn't a split because a split is two factions. This was at least four or five. Somebody said, well, what's that called? A big mess. I showed up there as a 29-year-old, barely 29. Almost every church in Danville got people out of that church through that situation. And the crowd that was left didn't like each other too well. And Jensen Franklin was with us in a revival that he had booked before I went there. I said, yeah, come on. We were coming to the last night of that revival. It was on a Friday night, and I'm telling you, if it could break loose, not the revival. I'm trying to find how I want to say this. Trouble. I want to say hell, but I won't. Trouble. If trouble could break loose, it broke loose. I walked into that office that night before Jensen went out to preach. I said, Jensen, you cannot leave me. I know it hasn't been that big of a revival, but you cannot leave me right now. I actually talked him into staying until the next Wednesday night, Brother Griffiths, because I was going through some stuff in that church. I needed help from the Lord. And on that Monday morning, in that second week, I'd been in that sanctuary praying. You've been there. Beautiful, round, fan-shaped kind of sanctuary. And I said, God, I was minding my own business where I was. I didn't have to come here and do this. But here I am, and I need to know that you're with me. I need to know that you sent me here. I need to know that you have a plan for this church and you've got a plan for my life. And I heard your voice and I did not make a mistake by coming here. And I stopped just inside that sanctuary with my hand on the door. I said, God, I need to hear from you today, please. Walked on back to my office. I hadn't been there long and knock came on the door. His mother-in-law was standing at my door. Frances Willis stood there with a cake box in her hand. The bottom of it was warm, freshly baked. We chit-chatted for a while. She left. I turned to leave that cake on the desk. I looked in that box, and there was a card. I've got it to this day. I could go get it right now and tell you where it is. That card said, Pastor, Walter and I love you. And whatever you do, don't you ever doubt God sent you here. Oh, I know. Well, I thought it'd be a little bit more dramatic than a hot cake on your desk. Well, let me tell you what that cake was. That was my handful. Oh, I'm going to preach before I finish here tonight. I wished I could tell you that's the only one I had to have. But I got in a building program. Anybody ever been through one of those? I had haggled with contractors until I felt like a building contractor more than a gospel preacher. I was totally fed up one day. I told my secretary, Barbara, I said, I'm going to the house. I really don't need anybody to call me there or find me there. And I remember driving across Danville, going to my house, and I looked in that side mirror, in that rear view mirror, thinking, God, the happiest day of my life will be when I see that town and those mirrors for the final time. I drove up to my house, walked in. I wanted Paula to know I was upset. I walked in in a huff and a puff. She said, what's the matter, darling? I said, I'm not going to go into it, but I'll tell you. Now, how many really think I talk to her like that? <laughs> now, listen, you're not married 43 years talking like that. I said, baby doll, I'm not going to go into it. But I can tell you right now, if that phone rings and it's a state overseer you're giving me half a chance to get out of here, I'm gone. Folks, the phone rang. 
a man on the other end of the line said, is this Tim Hill? I said, yes, it is. Very curt. He said, I've got to talk to you. He said, my wife and I sat up last Saturday night late listening to a tape back in the old cassette tape days. He said, we listened to a tape of a sermon you preached in South Georgia camp meeting in 1990. A sermon called Worn Out But Still Going. He said, I'd made up my mind I would resign that next morning. And we listened to it once. We listened to it twice. On the third time around, I called my youth pastor to come listen to it at 2 o'clock in the morning because he was going to resign with us. We listened to it for the third time, and God changed our heart. I didn't resign, and God's helping us. He said, Preacher, I was at the post office today. I had wrapped that tape up to mail to Kentucky to a Baptist preacher friend of mine that's got to hear this. And he said, when I dropped it in the mailbox and I heard it thud, he said, the Holy Ghost told me, find the man who preached that sermon. And you tell him I'm not finished with him yet. I said, what'd you say the name of it was? He said, worn out but still going. He said, I can tell you the points. I said, well, tell me. He said, you preached about don't lose your head, don't lose your heart, and don't lose your hope. Bishop Doherty, I got up from the couch. I hadn't been there 10 minutes. I got up from the couch, and I headed back to the door. Paula said, where are you going? You just got here. I said, I'll tell you where I'm going. I'm going back to that church, and I'm going to dig around in my closet till I find a tape of an old sermon I used to preach called Worn Out But Still Going. And I'm going to see if I can find what he found. And I found it. I put that tape in that old player and I sat on the floor, in the middle of my floor. And I hit play and I hit rewind and I hit play and I hit rewind. And I heard a young man preaching that had not been through a building program. <laughs> I heard a young man preaching that had not been through a pandemic. I heard a young man preaching that was fresh. And but Marshall, I said, God, I don't know where that went, but if you'll trust me enough to give it back to me, I won't let it go again. Somebody said, well, what was that? And I wished I could tell you I didn't let it go again. You want some transparency tonight? You want to see my heart? I got real close about two and a half years ago. This will cost me my job. You want it? <laughs> when this pandemic hit, I got about as low one day as I thought I could humanly get. I said, God, you got to help me because i got to help everybody else. I don't have the luxury of being this low. you got to help me. I didn't go out and do something stupid. But i got secretaries here tonight that will tell you what I did. I got so low one day, I went to my office, David. And I took off my wall every personal picture, every personal plaque, everything personal to me because I honestly felt like I may have to get out of here quick. You postpone a General Assembly sometime. Is this too, is this too real? I pitched them all in the back of my car. I carried them in my car for a year. Thinking I might put them back up someday. I'll tell you the rest of that story in a minute. But I said, God, our pastors are crushed right now. If you're letting me go through this because I need to feel what they're feeling, you win. You got it. And God, i got to shoot videos tomorrow. I'm going to get on a live stream video tomorrow, and I'm going to say, just a minute. 
You can trust God. I'll see you next time for just a minute. I can tell this crowd don't watch my just a minute program. <laughs> yeah, look that up. You'll really like it. And God started working on me. God started working on me. I totally took down my love me wall. All my pictures, all my plaques, all my songwriting stuff. Took all that down. Hadn't put it up yet. Because in this process, God has taught me that it ain't about you. Don't put your love me wall back up there, Mr. Hill. Don't put your plaques back up there. It's not about you. And I found myself in San Antonio, Texas, doing assembly preparation. And I had prayed the prayer just a few days before I went there to just do a personal site visit and some logistics and prayer walk. I do it at every assembly. I go to the host city and I prayer walk. And before I left my hotel room one day, I said, God, I'm at another place where I need to hear from you. Didn't think I'd ever have to have it again, but I got to have it. Because there's too many people depending on me to have this thing together. I need to hear from you in an unusual way. I need to hear from you almost in a breathtaking way, in a way that I cannot deny. I need to hear from you that you've got this in your hand. That's what I said. I said, I got to know you got it in your hand. And I'm prayer walking. Walking down by that river. And I decide, you know what, I'm going to get something to eat. And the restaurant that I was going to go into, a barbecue restaurant there on that river walk, was crammed, packed full of people. I couldn't get in immediately. And I'm just standing on the bottom step, leaning against a rail, and I notice out of my peripheral vision there's someone staring at me. Right over in here. And I've got my sunglasses on because I don't want to be bothered. And I kind of turn away. And soon he gets from my peripheral vision to right here. And I take my sunglasses off. He says, I think I know you. I didn't know him. He said, aren't you Tim Hill? I said, dear Lord, I'm glad I was behaving. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I said, how do you know me? He said, I heard you preach in Texarkana, Texas, several months ago in a conference. He said, I've followed your ministry since then. He wasn't Church of God. He said, can I tell you something and not be thought to be bizarre? I said, sure. He said, you can believe this or disbelieve this. But when my wife and I got to San Antonio a couple of days ago, he was a pastor. He said, the Lord had already spoken to my heart that I would have an encounter with someone here that he has put together. It's not an accident. It's not a haphazard thing. The Lord spoke to me that while I'm in San Antonio, he would bring me in the presence of someone. And when I saw them, I would know this is a divine moment that God has orchestrated. He said, that moment is now. He said, but let me tell you the rest of it. He said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me in prayer when he told me I would have this divine moment, this divine encounter, that when I saw that person, I'm to give him a message. He's had my attention. 
I said, what is it, sir? He said, the Lord told me to tell whoever it was I would meet. And he held out his hand. The Lord told me to tell whoever it would be, God's got it right there. Somebody said, what do you call a meeting like that? I didn't know I was going to be here tonight to preach. Toby Morgan's one of the greatest preachers you'll ever hear. I wished he could have been here. But for whatever reason, here I am. And it just might be, brother, this little sermon's your handful on purpose. It just might be, man of God, this will help you go a little further. Mike, my little stopover tonight hadn't been very dramatic, but it just might be on one of your days, if you ever have them, you don't have them, but I have them. You might hold that up and say, devil, I was there on a Thursday night when Tim Hill put that in my hand, and you just need to know I'm not giving up now. Amen. Stand to your feet in this house. Lift your hands and give God some praise. Reach over and put your arm around somebody. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is moving in this house. The Holy Ghost is moving in this house. I want every pastor, every pastor's companion, I want to lay it to anybody that needs a handful on purpose to take home with you tonight or remind you of the message that you've heard tonight. Just start walking and pick these up. Just pick you one up. Pick one up. Just pick one up. Ushers, help me. Help me pass these out. Help me pass these out. Mm. Just hand them out. Just come from all over this place. Get one, get one, get one. There may be a few more inside that bag. Jonathan, you remember that old song? I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me. If I live a holy life, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will make a way for me. Lift your hands and sing. I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know listen to me I know you've come and you've picked these up and you've gone back to your seat but I'm not finished before I got over here tonight running late 
I felt the Holy Spirit say, what I've done in your life, I'm going to do for everybody there tonight that will let me. Gerald McGinnis, there is a deep healing that's going to happen here tonight. There are bruises, there are, there's brokenness, there are wounds deep in the spirit and the soul of men and women here tonight. Somebody said, when are we going to finally put all this behind us and quit talking about this pandemic when God totally heals you and sets you free? He's about to show you. He's ready for it to be behind you tonight. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm off base here at all. I need every pastor and your companion to join hands and come back down here and stand with me. God's going to heal ministry tonight. God's going to heal ministry tonight. Not trying to leave anybody out, but I feel like if God can heal a ministry tonight, he'll heal a church. If he can heal a minister and his family tonight, God will heal a church. Sing this again, church. For me.